Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. My first live stream since I ended up in the emergency room at the beginning of July and had to have my gallbladder removed. And I went dark for a month, as you've probably noticed, and based on all the comments and feedback I've gotten and people emailing me, social media saying, Laura, where are you? Are you okay? I am okay. I am still recovering from the surgery and everything, but I am okay. And I want to thank you all for missing the show. And uh, I want to apologize to all the guests that I had to postpone while I was recovering the month of July. This is my first live show since um, I ended up off grid. And I'll tell you, it was the weirdest month I've ever seen. I mean, it's about six weeks now, and I'm trying to get back in the groove of things. And it is truly an honor to get back in the groove with my guest that I have on the show today, who I feel like I've known forever back when he was a journalist with the Hour newspapers, back when he was um, pretty high up there in the world of journalism and newspapers. And uh, I fell in love with this man because he's just one of the nicest, nicest people you could ever meet. And then we reconnected a bunch of years ago because he started writing amazing, amazing, amazing books and mystery books that I fell in love with that I literally could not put down until I'd finished the entire book in one sitting. And he's got a new book that's launching today. And I had to bypass a couple of um, launches while I was post-surgical and in the hospital, but I, I figured this was a great re-entry to do it with somebody that I care deeply for, who is an amazing author, whose new book, Shadow Hill, launches today. And oh, I just devoured it. And I read it multiple times and it is amazing. So I want to welcome Tom Kyes, AKA, as his book says, Thomas Kyes, to the show. My amazing friend who Oh my God, Tom, every book of yours, if, if I wasn't still recovering from surgery, I would have gone through all my bookcases that are in my garage after my mold situation upstairs and like bent over and gotten all of your books out because I've devoured everyone and their keepers. <laughs> Well, thank you, Laura. If I was there right now, I'd, I'd give you a big hug. Um, <laughs> this is this is the, the, the this is the nicest thing anybody said to me all day. So, um, and I'm glad it's coming from you. Well, thank you. And it's launch day today. Your book is coming out, and this is the fourth book in your Geneva Chase series. And th it's been an interesting journey for you from book one to book four because in the process your publisher got bought out and the team that you worked with changed and the way that they launched books changed and everything. So tell me about putting this book out, which I mean, I read it in a very, very early PDF version and I'm like, Oh my God, please release this book. And now I have my copy and I'm like petting it because it's so good. <laughs> so talk to me about your journey from journalist to, to author. Well, pretty much like anybody who works at a newspaper or a magazine, and I did that for 30 years, um, everybody wants to write a novel, uh, every single one of us. And I, it was actually a childhood dream of mine to, to write mysteries because I grew up with the Travis McGee series. And, wow. uh, you know, one of my earliest influences was Ian Fleming and the James Bond books. I can remember the old Signet novels. That right. were 60 cents each and we used to pass them around when i was uh in junior high so um so writing a book is just something that i always wanted and the first book was written from the viewpoint of geneva chase who's a female reporter who drinks way too much makes bad life decisions and she's just this snarky smart ass um i was only going to write just that one book uh, but the publisher liked it so well and it did so well, uh, as far as sales went, they signed me to uh, two more. And then after that, they signed me to Shadow Hill. And I just finished up the fifth novel uh, called Whisper Room that uh, we just went through the uh, editorial process with it. And that'll be out in 2022. So Geneva Chase is with me for a while. She's, she's, uh, 
she's up here somewhere. But, um, uh, and just one real quick story about Geneva Chase. She seems to be fairly real to a lot of folks. And um, I've got a, a close friend of mine who um, loves the books almost as much as you do. And we were sitting in a conference room one time and he said, you know, Tom, I absolutely just love Geneva Chase. And I said, John, you got to remember, I'm Geneva Chase. So be careful. Well, you know, I've known you for a long time and the book is based in Fairfield County, Connecticut, all of the the characters and the settings. And uh, one of the things that I noticed, because I know a lot of the same people that you know, I'm like, oh, wait, did he pattern this after that person? Or is that a real person? Because I swear that's a real person there and, and that. And that to me is so fascinating because for somebody that knows the area and knows you and knows a lot of the same friends, I'm like, where did he get this from? Because it is, but it isn't that person or that people. And you're writing a female main character and it's brilliant. And I know I said this the first time I interviewed you when your book's first book or second book came out. How do you do that? <laughs> you're, you know, it, it's shades of Daniel Silva and Lee Child and some of these totally amazing authors who you, you just forget who they are as a person and you're, you're seeing, you're just lost in the book, right? And when you come surface and you walk into another room, you come back, you fully expect to see the TV on because <laughs> it's so visual. I can yeah. write nonfiction. I don't know how fiction writers do it, but I've, I've got a very good. And by the way, there's a guy that just came online, Jim Dean, who Jim was Dean, another I hour. I know. I great. Hey, Jim. Um, so, right, writing uh, the the role of a female, uh, I wasn't gonna. That wasn't what I set out to do. Rand, Random Road was an experiment. I wrote one chapter from the viewpoint of Geneva Chase, and the other chapter from the viewpoint of a, a character called Kevin Bell. And um, it just turns out Geneva was a much more interesting character. Like I said, she's a snarky smartass, and she gets away with saying things that I can't in real life. Um, and I set it in a town called Sheffield because I did not want to get sued uh, by setting it actually in Norwalk, Connecticut. Right. Uh, so I make up a few towns, but I, I still put things in Westport or Wilton or Danbury uh, or Bridgeport. And or Manhattan, uh, New York or Man City. yeah, this she Geneva goes in and out of New York quite often, especially in this particular book. So uh, there are some real locations, and some of the characters um, are are based on real people, and uh, whether they look like them or not. I, as a matter of fact, in, in Shadow Hill, maybe it wasn't. No, it wasn't Shadow Hill. It was the the book prior that was uh, Graveyard Bay. I had an old boss. Um, here in, in North Carolina that I really did not like at all. So I wrote him into the book and it was, I, you know, he's still alive, but you know, I don't think he's going to make it through the fifth book. Frankly, he's going to be my murder victim. <laughs> all right. I'm just loving that you admitted that. <laughs> and, and, and Geneva Chase is really based upon, uh, Actually, two ladies I knew uh, at the newspaper um, because they they were snarky smart asses, and you know their their voices are in my head when I write Geneva Chase. One of the things that I find so fascinating, other than the fact that you've carried these characters through and grew them throughout the four books so far, is that they're not perfect right? They're, they're real and they have their struggles. And at the same time, I also sense a lot of real world kind of situations that you're bringing into the books of things that hit the news or things that I kind of felt, well, I had a feeling something happened, but nobody was willing to talk about it. It kind of got buried. You, you bring to light things that we all think in your books. And put it in such a way that it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just, you know what? Here's some facts. 
But is it really facts? I don't know. I leave that up to the reader to decide. That's kind of what I feel. So where did that come from from you? Well, Shadow Hill is something I've, I've really wanted to tackle for a while ever since I, I started being published. And I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, the climate change situation uh, right now. Uh, we're seeing it just all over the world. The UN just came out with a report that is dire. And uh, Shadow Hill is kind of my climate change book. And um, for, and and two, um, a lot of those facts in Shadow Hill are, are real facts. The, the United States government uh, gives a huge amount of subsidies to oil companies. And um, they, they don't with uh, renewable energy. I, I'm actually the president of an organization called the Business Alliance Protecting the Atlantic Coast. Uh, it's part of my day job here uh, in North Carolina. And we've been to Washington a number of times to talk to lawmakers about keeping offshore oil away from the Atlantic and Pacific coast. And it looks like we've got bills moving through the house right now that'll permanently ban offshore drilling. Um, and it looks like uh, we're moving more and more towards uh, offshore wind. So uh, I think we're headed in the right direction, but uh, you, you can you can tell there's, there's a certain en environmentalist passion there in, uh, in Shadow Hill. And uh, I did an awful lot of research for that particular book. There, I dog-eared one page towards the beginning. There were many pages I could have dog-eared to talk about, but I don't want to spoil things. But I needed to ask you something. On, on Towards the beginning of the book, you said, off to one side of the desk was a stack of books. I read the titles out loud. The Path to Power, Three Days in Moscow, Churchill, Presidents of War, then I picked up something that surprised me, the uninhabitable earth, life after warning, warming. Are those real books? Because I didn't Google them to check. Every single they were. Every single one of those books is real. And um, that last one is, is a very scary book of, about climate change. So, um, yeah, all of those books are real. And there's so much of that peppered throughout Shadow Hill is these there's like enough um brad taylor once said to me i don't know i, I think you know brad oh, yeah taylor, yeah, yeah. I, as a matter of fact i saw him on your show right and and brad parks on my show one yep, time too yep. so brad taylor when he was releasing one of his books i interviewed him and i was like how much of what you write is real and how much isn't and he said i pepper enough when I'm talking about a real place that street really exists, that cafe might really exist or something like that. He said, because if you pepper enough actual facts that people can Google or find out that are real, then it makes them begin to think that everything else is real. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's how you, how you achieve that suspension of disbelief. You, yeah. you, you you're trying to make everything just as real as possible. The characters, you know, they, you've got to, you got to make them sweat and you got to, you know, they, they, they can't be perfect because nobody is perfect except for me. <laughs> All right. So, so let's, let's talk about that because, you know, I've known you a long time. I always felt you were perfect. You were with Poison Pen Press. This book is still published by Poison Pen Press. It got bought by Sourcebooks, a much bigger publishing house. You and I were talking because I noticed crazy things like editor changes and, and things like that. What's it like working with an editor to put something out like this? And then after three books, have a new publisher and a new editor. I mean, how does that work for you? I know a lot of my listeners are wannabe authors or are authors. And there are a number of them self-published and a number of them want to be with publishers. And they're like, well, what's that like? Really, truly like? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to say, I, I love the, the people I work with. And, um, I, and to be honest as well, everybody I work with, are, they're female. All my editors are female. Uh, the copy editors are female, the, the people who design the covers, my publishers have all been females. So they've, they've kept me straight as far as my character, Geneva Chase. 
Um, I've learned more about women's shoes than I really should. Um, but working, you know, each editor has a different way of, of working and you have to kind of work to that end. I listen very closely to what they say because they're experts. They, they do this every single day. I, I only know about my books and I do know, I do a lot of reading. I mean, I read a lot of mysteries cause I just love them. Um, but every time I have a new editor, it's, it's a bit of an adjustment. And I was working with a new editor just on my uh, book coming out in 2022. And she's, she's, I mean, she's great. Um, I love her to pieces. She has these great witty comments in the margins and um, she's got some really terrific suggestions. So um, it's, it's not painful at all. It's, it's just something that I, I advise new writers to, to have an editor. I, I teach a creative writing class here at the local community college. And uh, a lot of folks wonder what their next step is after they've written a book. This is find yourself an editor. And uh, because they will find things and know things that you just simply won't. Describe the process of working with your editor. Um, what I generally do is I'll write the first hundred pages of a book and I'll send it off to the editor and she will tell me uh, whether I'm on the right track or not. And along with that book, I'll have a synopsis that'll go to the publisher uh, just to let them know, you know, what I'm thinking of as far as the book goes. And that's really hard because as I'm writing, things change. I, I might take a completely different trail uh, than what I originally had thought I was going to take. But um, so they, they get the first hundred pages, they send me back a critique, and then I, I will write the rest of the book and they won't see anything until I finish the manuscript. And then I send it off to them and they'll have it for about a month and uh, they'll send back uh, a marked copy, an electronic marked copy, which for me is very difficult to work with because I'm, you know, I'm an old guy in old school and I work with paper. But um, that's that's how we work these days is electronically. And I will either agree with their suggestions and their adjustments, or I'll say, well, this is this is really what I had in mind. Maybe we can we can change this. So now that edited manuscript is back with my editor again. And then I may see it one more time after she sends back a second set of edits. But it's, it's a little bit like a tennis game. It goes back and forth until we're both comfortable with the way the book uh, looks. And you, by the way, you've got a great eye. You were able to tell that Shadow Hill had a new editor. So I am very impressed, uh, Lori. You're a very discerning reader. Well, you know, I've coached a lot of authors as well to get their books together. And I've worked with editors on, on my books and everything. But there was a cadence change to me in in this book compared to the others. And it still was totally you and totally Geneva Chase, but to somebody who's worked with editors, you can discern this slight adjustment. Not that it changed anything, but I was like, huh, okay, I need to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, it's a good good question. It was, and there are subtle differences when you're dealing with different editors. So um, the, the one I worked with on Shadow Hill had an excellent suggestion as far as uh, my getting from point A to point B. And that made it just such a much stronger book. Um, but there were some other things that she, you know, she really wasn't interested in, in you know, marking up. So um, good eye. And we'll see it, you know, when Whisper Room comes out in 2022, if you notice a change with that one. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it because I devour these as soon as I get them in my hands. You had mentioned to me before we got on the air that the editor wanted you to change the ending and you didn't want to change it, but you did something else that made the book stronger. So can we talk about that? Sure. Uh, you know, I don't want to give the ending away, but the, no, I thought don't, it was, no, let's give any details, but I, and I'm not, but the, the, I, when I started writing shadow Hill, of course I, I knew what the crime was and I have a vague notion of what the ending looks like. And I wanted that ending in the book. I, it's, I thought it was one of the strongest endings I've ever written. It, so, it was excellent. Yeah, thank you. But <laughs> interestingly enough, my editor said, you know, I guessed how this was going to end too soon. 
So she said, change the ending. And I said, I don't want to change the ending. I'll go back and rewrite parts of the book. And I won't let anybody figure out how this is going to end. So um, how, how Geneva actually got to that location of the ending, my, my editor was absolutely right. It was too easy. And I had to make it a whole lot more difficult. And, um, and I did, I think. You did, because I, I wasn't expecting what happened. And then I thought, oh, okay, that's going to happen. And then you shifted me again. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> I thought I figured it out. <laughs> In that case, I did my job. You definitely, you definitely did your job. And what's it like for you, Tom, juggling being an author, you know, a very, very successful author who has been on tours, book tours, and and you've spoken at large mystery conferences and things like that, which obviously in 2020, a lot of that, those panels and things got changed. They didn't necessarily go to uh, virtual, but you also have a full-time job, which is a pretty amazing job. I call you the networking king because of what you do. So how do you juggle that? And if you're willing to share with people what your day job is beyond heading up this organization to save our planet, <laughs> the Atlantic Yeah, Coast. no, I, my, my day job, I'm the, uh, I'm the president of the Carteret County Chamber of Commerce. We're here on the coast of North Carolina. So I, I help promote uh, businesses here in our market. And uh, this is, I mean, it's a beautiful area. I've had the best job in the world. I live on a barrier island, and uh, I just come across the bridge every day to the mainland to my office here. And uh, I, my social life, unfortunately, is on just about everything with a job. It's uh, business after hours events, and ribbon cuttings, and you know, business openings. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of that in 2020. So um, that's when I had time to write Whisper Room. That'll be coming out in 2022. And even now, some of the conferences uh, are being can canceled. There was supposed to be one in New Orleans in two weeks, and I was on one of the panels, and I was going to moderate a panel, and that's been canceled. So um, it's you know we're kind of getting back into the soup again. And they're um, not going to switch it to virtual. Uh, no, it's really too late for them to do something like that. So oh no, I I'm, I take that back. They are going to have a couple of virtual events. So um, yeah, I, I was just lying to you about that. So at any rate, I've got the Chamber of Commerce gig. Uh, I am part of uh, Business Alliance Protecting the Atlantic Coast. I teach creative writing, and I teach an advanced creative writing at the college. And uh, I'm, of course, because I'm with the Chamber of Commerce, I'm on a lot of different boards. I'm on the Transportation Board. I'm on the Economic Development Foundation. And uh, I'm working with NOAA, actually, with uh, the Marine Sanctuary Program. So... Um, I don't, I don't have any real social personal life. I just, I, and, and, you know, the only hobby I have is writing or, or reading a novel. Uh, so there. <laughs> you know, back when we first met in Norwalk, Connecticut, and, you know, I was an ambassador for the Norwalk chamber and I was on the board of the Norwalk chamber and I was on the board of a whole bunch of charities and nonprofits and, you know, like you, very, very involved with all of that. I had forgotten how, until you just said it, how basically when you're involved all like that, your social life changes because you've got the business after hours that you're constantly doing. So you've got your work all day that you're doing in any committees or boards. And then you're going to charity events every evening. You're going to chamber events. You're constantly building your business when that stops so much, I mean, as the president of a chamber of commerce, I mean, we're going to diverge a little bit from, from the author talk, but because of your role as the head of a chamber of commerce, I would love if you would share how that's affected the chamber of commerce and the people in Carteret County. I mean, chambers are such a lifeblood to help small businesses, main street businesses really grow. So what's yeah, it been we, like for you? We, we definitely had to do a, a number of pivots and we're still doing pivots uh, even now because uh, we're, we're having a resurgence of COVID, the Delta variant. Um, we had to stay relevant 
first and foremost. And through the internet and various social media platforms, we we set up a network where uh, we could help uh, our membership get the word out, whether or not they were working remotely or they were doing just takeout or uh, they had just opened. We had a number of businesses that opened during 2020 and did pretty well. And then when this seemed to start to fade, they were doing very well. But to, to give you a little bit of background, um, because we are here on the coast and we have some wonderful beaches, our tourism here in 2020 was record breaking. We had more people here than we've ever had. And 2021 is breaking those records. Wow. Uh, yeah, people people not only want to come here to visit, but they want to live here now. The The housing market is just super hot. They don't want to live in a big city where, um, you know, it's it's hard to so, be socially distant. But it's easy here because the beaches aren't packed and crowded um, yet. yet. Um, so, I, I mean, we're, we're just seeing people here year round now. And when I first got here in 2006, everything shut down in the off season. So that's not that's not the case anymore. It's uh, we're seeing kind of an evolution on our our, our little coast, um, and part of that's because of the chamber of commerce. So, you know, an increase in traffic here is uh, you know it, it means we're doing a good job. But boy, I'll tell you, I prefer when there's no traffic around or nobody on the beach. Frankly, it's it's a lot nicer. Yeah, I live, as you know, in Florida, in Sebastian, Florida, and. It's very seasonal, Vero Beach, Sebastian, Florida. And when COVID hit, we noticed that the snowbirds, which are, for my listeners, snowbirds are people who migrate south when the snow hits up north, and then they leave generally in April and go back to their northern climbs and stuff like that. We also are noticing here less people leaving and more people who have moved here that are just year rounders. Now they sold up North and they came down here and it's really great for the property values. They've gone up like 30%. I mean, it's made it so that it's very difficult for year round people to sort of live because all the prices have gone up because all these people have come in. The infrastructure can't really handle it. Wasn't designed for it. So you're talking about, very much a beach community for yourself and even for here that doesn't have that infrastructure to handle tens of thousands of more people moving in. So how do you handle that as a community, as a chamber of commerce, balancing the, because our councils have not really handled it well. Do you know what I'm saying? They're like, yeah, we want you all, but not looking at the quality of life change that dramatically has happened. Water table issues, you know, um, all those things that have happened. How do you handle that as somebody who is big on climate change, right? So now you've got an infrastructure near the water that you guys hadn't planned for this. As a chamber of commerce president, right? looking like this is really great for business, but is it? Yeah, you know, and there's no real good answer to that, Laura. Um, I, I work very closely with a lot of different organizations here in our county and actually in our state. And um, we're seeing a lot of problems. Of course, like you said, property values have gone way up. The infrastructure is strained. We, we only have a year-round population of about 70,000 people. And during the tourist season, that goes up to about 250,000 people. So you can see the crowds on the road and grocery stores. And, you know, we have some supply chain problems on occasion. Um, and we have uh, a highway, super highway. It's gonna be uh, done in about 10 years, I-42. So we take a look at what happened to some of the other beach locations and uh, see what problems they have. And one of them is, one of my favorite cities is Wilmington, North Carolina. It's it's a great town, but boy, the traffic there is just awful because they did not plan ahead when the uh, interstate uh, came their way. So we know the interstate is coming our way and we've been talking, like I said, I'm on the transportation committee. We've been working with uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation to see what we can do to mitigate uh, what we know are going to be crowds and county commissioners have already talked about 
what they can do as far as expanding the schools here, because you you know there are going to be parents bringing their kids. Right. So, um, and and on top of which, just even now we're having the same problems a lot of other places. Uh, we can't find employees to work in the restaurants, and the grocery stores, and uh, the hotels, and uh, we don't have the housing for them to to come here. Everything is is too expensive. So we're we are we're going through growing pains and um right at the moment there's there's no quick fix it's going to be something that's going to take some time to to work through i know you write fiction books but i can ease on fiction book tom about this shift this change in where people are moving to and how it affects small communities and the things that these communities need to begin thinking about. Uh, my parents, when I was little, they used to take me down to Miami when I was a little girl and Miami was nothing like it is today. And I remember we'd be on the beach and there, there were a couple of hotels on the beach and they were very family oriented and you would, there was none of that strip that they talk about. And my parents told me about Palm Beach because they had gone to, back in 1950, they went to Palm Beach and they really wanted to see Marjorie Post's mansion, Mar-a-Lago, which now everybody knows Donald Trump owns. But back then it was Marjorie Post. And my dad really wanted to see it. <laughs> and he drove up and he knocked on the door. My mom's sitting in the car like, really seriously, you're knocking on the door. And the butler answered. And when the butler answered, my dad said, you know, my wife and I are newly married. They had just recently gotten married. And we've always wanted to see this house. We've heard so much about it. Is there any way we could see it or you can tell us about the house? And the butler goes, well, Mrs. Post is not home, but I'd be happy to show you and your wife around the house. And they got a personal tour of Marjorie Post House Mar-a-Lago with by the butler, you know, and he took them through the house and everything. It was amazing. And he also told them a story because back then, Palm Beach, the island itself, the barrier island, all the big homes, the really expensive homes. And my dad was like, well, where do the people who work in these homes live? And he says, oh, that's West Palm over the bridge. They couldn't afford to live here. But I feel like we're coming, starting to come back to that because so many of these communities are building to a spot where you were to live there. So who's going to work and hold the infrastructure if we price the communities out? So I also could see you in one of your books starting to bring that in there. Maybe a character who's so frustrated couldn't afford or she couldn't afford to live where, where she is. I mean, you talk about it a little bit in, in here, but what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, before I talk about that, you, you reminded me of a book that recently came out by Carl Hyacin called Squeeze Me. Oh. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but it, it is, it's freaking hilarious. I, I met him. He's a really cool man. Oh, he's, he's a super writer and it all takes place down in a Mar-a-Lago type of location. Right. Uh, and and there's a president and a first lady in the president's uh, secret. And he's patterned after, obviously, Donald Trump. Um, but the book is just hilarious. Um, yeah, um, the, the housing problem is is a really tough one. One of the uh, one of the ways uh, we have a grocery store chain down here, they get around this when they need the extra help they'll um, bring in uh, young people from uh, the Ukraine or Jamaica, um, and they own a house where they will actually put them up for the summer. And uh, the young folks, you know, they get a chance to live down here by the beach and, and make some American money. And uh, it's not a bad way to spend the summer. They couldn't do that in 2019 because nobody was traveling. And it put a real strain. You saw a lot of managers and company owners working seven days a week. And even now we've got restaurants that are closing three days a week because they don't want to burn out the staff. Right. Uh, on the 4th of July, there were a lot of restaurants closed on the 4th and the 5th 
um, just simply because they, I mean, they had record breaking crowds, but they were afraid they're going to burn out their, their staff. Yeah, I think you definitely should consider writing a nonfiction book just about what you're saying. I know I would read it and a lot of people would read it, especially with your, your background. And I, you already have started, you know, weaving like the climate change stuff into, into Shadow Hill in a way that makes it very accessible. In each of your books, there's some relevant something going on there. And I think that's the journalist in you, right, Tom, that sees these different things that have gone on. There are some, there's one theme that goes throughout several of the books, which has a, a character, Shauna, who is a dominatrix. <laughs> I don't get that, Tom. I mean, why? How? I mean, it's in multiple of the books. Yeah. And I love the way you build that character because she is just a strong, fearless woman, not a victim, not anything. And she does so much good, but I'm curious. Yeah. Through, through my checkered past, um, I, I actually knew uh, a lady very similar to that. And actually she had the same job. She was a professional dominatrix. In her spare time, what she would do is she would work with uh, victims of human trafficking. And she actually ran an organization just like Shannon East uh, does in the books. And it seemed to be this, this strange dichotomy, almost like an oxymoron, where you've got this woman who enjoys controlling other people, um, but yet she wants to go out and help people who have been controlled by other people. Right. It, it, it was just, it was an amazing thing to me. And um, I, 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 Shannon Neese is, is a cool character to write. And uh, she, she's just, she's a, she's a badass. I mean, yeah. she is, <laughs> and my editors absolutely love her. And, and uh, so Shannon's going to be around for a while, I think. Well, I'm, I even toyed with the idea of making a spinoff series with Shannon East and John Stillwater. And I, I still might do that one of these days. I could totally see that. And it's really funny because when I was reading Shadow Hill, I because you gave a little more pieces of them in, in this book, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to know what John Stillwater is doing when he goes to where he's going. I want to know what he's doing in there. I want to know what he and Shauna niece are doing, where those characters are and, and how Nathaniel is involved with that kind of thing. So, so yes, please write a book about that. <laughs> yeah. Nathaniel figures pretty heavily in Shadow Hill and not quite as much in the next book, but John Stillwater and Shanna do. So um, I, I, if, if I do get tired of writing Geneva Chase, I am going to move into the, the, the Shanna John uh, series. I can't picture you getting tired of writing about Geneva Chase only because there's so many elements to her character that you've built up that you haven't fully explored yet that can, can take you in a lot of different arenas and ways and things like that. There's so much we still don't know about her. So I'm going to, I, I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, okay. during 2020 and the lockdown. Uh, you know, I I didn't know whether or not source books, uh, Poison Pen would want a, a fifth book or not, a fifth Geneva Chase book. So I actually started working on something completely different. And my agent called at some point in time just to see how I was doing. And I told her about this particular book and I could hear her go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Um, I want you to write a fifth Geneva Chase book. <laughs> so, so I, I started working on it. And she said the reason why was Geneva continues to grow. And she wants to see how she continues to grow even more. And if you'll notice, uh, she's, she's not drinking in book number four at all. And that's a struggle for her. And because um, I got, frankly, I got tired of her drinking so much. I, I just... I, you know, it was going to kill her sooner or later. Yeah. It, it, but you made it so real in it. And, and the way you talked about it, and then you bring in this other character 
who is drinking and her response to that. It. I'm so glad your agent said you have to do another Geneva Chase. I really, I'm, I'm so happy for it. I mean, there's so much in here that I'm like, what? Really? Oh my God, no. <laughs> hey, you know, you, you make my day when you, when you do that. That's, um, <laughs> well, I think uh, it is launch day. It is launch day. And what's, what's funny is uh, a lot of folks compliment me by saying, you know, I, I read the book in one sitting or I read the book over the course of two days or three days. And of course, that, that's a huge compliment that your book has a page term. But then I got to remind them, you know, it took me a whole year to write that damn thing. So, you know, it took you like maybe 24 hours to get through it. And it takes me 12 months. So um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So talk it's about like, your thanks. writing. Go ahead. So talk about your writing process, Tom, then. You know, you say it took a year. But I, my guess is it didn't take you a year to write it. It took a year to to write it, go through editing, go through revisions, or did it take you a year to write it? It, it took me close to a year to, to write Shadow Hill. And the reason, I I will write a first scene without knowing how the rest of the book's going to go. I don't even know who the bad guy or bad guys or bad ladies are. And um, I will rewrite that first chapter 15, 16 times before I'm, I'm satisfied with it. And then I'll write two or three chapters after that and I might rewrite them just because I don't know if that's the right direction to take. Okay. I, I don't have an outline that I work with. There's there's two types of writers. One is a plotter where you plot the whole book out. And the other one is a pantser where you're flying by the seat of your pants when you're writing. Stephen King is a pantser. He does not outline any of his books. So uh, for me, it's kind of this adventure where I don't know what the next chapter is going to look like or what the next plot twist is, is going to be. and then. Um, and then I get to a certain point in the book where I say, I have got to start planning because now I've got, I've got a, I've got a story going here and I'll start writing out what the rest of the chapters are going to look like and where I need the characters to go and where actually, where I need the clues to go. Because you, you, if you're going to write a mystery, you've got to put clues in there. So at least the reader has an opportunity to go, yeah, now I know why. Or yes, of course, that's where they ended up. Uh, or, yeah, I should have seen. That's the bad guy, you know. Um, so that's 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 the magic trick to writing a mystery is knowing where to put the clues and not make them too obvious. John David Mann, um, a dear friend of mine, who unfortunately I couldn't um, do his launch of Steel Fear, his and Brendan Webb's first mystery book that came out. Uh, he wrote another book called Write Good or Gooder, I think it's called. And he wrote it because people kept asking him about his writing process. He's been a, a ghost writer or a co-author for a lot of books for a lot of people, plus written several of his own. He's most well known for the book The Go-Giver with Bob Berg. And people kept saying, I want to know about your writing process. So he wrote this book and one of the most famous books about writing is Stephen King's On Writing, which I devoured before I wrote my first book. And your process is so different from what John describes and writes in his book, which I think you would love reading his book about writing, do good or write good or gooder. It, it's a fascinating thing where he shows like his unedited paragraphs or whatever, and then how it completely changed and how editors can shift things. And it's a lot of fun to do that. But John sits in the same chair every day with his cup of tea and he has his notepad and paper and he starts sort of trying to get words out, whether it's one line or whatever. And then he expands upon it and he has all these books, notebooks that have ideas and thoughts and things that he probably took out of a book that didn't work. And then he goes, oh, well, this book that will work in. Do you have stuff like that going on? Things that you go, well, it doesn't really work here, but it may work in the fifth book or in a book about some of the other characters I want to expand upon? Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, before my first book, Random Road, was published, I had actually written four other novels that never saw the light of day. Um, one of them was called Graveyard Bay. It was a horror story. 
and um, I, you know, it will never be published, but I love the title. So Graveyard Bay became the title of my third book. And in it scared a, the heck out of me, by the way. Graveyard <laughs> Bay scared me. It and was, it, it was brilliant. In, in my second book, uh, Darkness Lane, um, I, I took two characters from a thriller I had written called Night Chains, and the, they were two Russians from the Russian Mafia. And I plunked those two characters down into Darkness Lane, and uh, even they made an appearance in Graveyard Bay. I love those characters so much that um, they were just total, totally bad. They were, yeah, they were. <laughs> there's there's nothing nice about them at all. But uh, I love those characters so much that they they saw the light of day in two of my books. So, you know, you 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 can write something even if it's in a journal or an idea or something, and if it's it's good, it'll find life. It'll 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 come back to you at some point in time, and you'll be able to use it. So. Uh, when I'm teaching my creative writing class, I, I always tell my students to um, write something every day. Whether it doesn't, you know, might not be a chapter to anything, um, but write down what you saw today, or write down a snippet of dialogue, or, or you know, write a description of somebody that you saw that you found uh, very interesting. Uh, because if you stop writing, um, you stop writing, and a writer has to write. Yeah, I haven't been writing very much. <laughs> and, You've got a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's been the last couple of years, and I, I miss it. I have these thoughts, but before I can get them on paper, they're done. So I, I love that idea of you need to just write, because writers need to write, right? Mm -hmm. um, hi, and right. We just got another note from Tina Frank. Uh, she has a great podcast as well. Um, thanks, Tina. It's great to be back and to be here with my dear friend, Tom Kyes, who wrote the amazing book, Shadow Hill, the fourth book in the Geneva Chase series, which I love so much. I, I so desperately want to read something from the book, but I don't want to do that because I don't want to ruin it because <laughs> it's just so good. It's really um, an amazing, an amazing book. And I read it multiple times because I had forgotten that way, way back you had sent me a PDF of it in the very early because I begged you and begged you. And you're like, okay, Laura, here it is. Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, I got tired of hearing you whine. Well, you know, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a huge fan. You know, I, I was a huge fan of you when you were with newspapers and before you started writing books. But, you know, I've had an opportunity to interview multiple New York Times bestselling authors. You know, I, I interviewed Nicholas Sparks in front of a thousand people live, right? Debbie Maycomber at her 35th anniversary fan event live on stage, you know, and a number of other New York Times bestselling authors. And I, I love their books, right? But when I read your books, they're, they're fresh, right? They're, they're not formulaic. There's so much, as you read them, you can feel the development of the characters versus some people. And, and I'm not talking Debbie. I love to death. Oh my God. I devour every single book she writes because like you, every book she writes is still fresh. Like you believe every one of the characters. There's so much realism in them. And there's other people that I've met that asked me to interview them. And I went, no, because I, I knew that who they were was not who they are, right? They had a persona that they put out there and you and your books are real. And I think uh -huh. that's really, really important for my listeners to understand, Tom, is that there are authors and then there are authors. I've met Stephen King. He's an amazing man. What you see is what you get, you know? And I feel you've got massive longevity. I want people to know about your books because they're awesome. I would love for you to write a nonfiction book about the experiences you've had with the business and the climate and all that other stuff and weave those stories in because you have that knack that it just feels real and flows and, and isn't like hitting you in the face with it. And it, uh, you read it and you go, 
is that real? Is that not? If that's not real, that should be real because, you know, that's really fascinating. I, I love you so much, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that only did you make me your first show that when you came back, but you're, you're saying such nice things about me. I just, you know, um, Thank you so much. And I had never really given a thought to writing a nonfiction book before because I make crap up, you know. Um, so we'll just, I'll have to be thinking about that now. I, I just think it is just really would be an interesting take on it because of your multiple roles and multiple hats you wear in the real world. With your skill of writing fiction, you have the ability to write something that is important that needs to be heard about how small towns are changing, how the world is shifting and what we need to think about because we all don't live in New York. I mean, again, New York city. Oh my God. Joel Wald just, uh, noted. Good to see you back where you belong. Thank you so much. See everybody. people. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> It, it makes me feel really, really good. But, you know, it's it's interesting to me, Tom, because we, we've talked about you as a writer. We've talked about you as a business person. Um, what does your wife think about all of this and your puppy? Um, puppy's great, by the way. She's she's my writing pal. Um, and my wife is, is a great motivator. She's She's been in my corner since before we were published and uh she is my quasi manager now she kind of handles my social life what there is of it and uh we were going to do a book launch this afternoon but i told you before we came on the show that uh the place we were going to do it had uh two uh exposures to covid so they had to close so i'm postponing that you are my book event laura um i'm honored uh, there, there was a, another writer whom I, I think the world of. His name's Peter McCook. He's a, a world famous poet, and he does short stories. And he, he's been my mentor actually. And he read Shadow Hill, and he was just remarkably complimentary. And uh, my wife wrote back to him and said, uh, "Great, we've already had to expand the, the doorway so we can get Tom's head through there." Um, so she, she keeps me grounded. Um, and but she also, uh, you know, she really enjoys the writing process, and she enjoys uh, going to these book events. And quite and Cindy uh, has written a book. She um, she was a market research analyst, and she was actually she was a world renowned market research analyst. And she wrote a book called Wired, and uh, so she was actually published before I was. Well, somehow I'm going to have to get a copy of, of her book as well. Well, I will tell you up front, I didn't understand any of it. So it's, it's, <laughs> she's, she's a much smarter individual than I am. Well, I'm totally going to have to get a copy of her book. I, it just sounds intriguing to me. I read a lot of nonfiction. There are very few fiction authors that I have on my show because most of my show is, you know, it's called It's All About the Questions and how to change your life by, you know, hearing the questions and the answers that I ask people on the show and what they say shifted them. So most of what I read is nonfiction, but when I have a really awesome fiction book, which is my mental escape, right? Because you can't always have your brain on that way. Somehow you need to transport yourself. And um, these books do. So Tom, we're getting close to the end of the show. How can people get the book? Where can they get it? And uh, I know you're not having your book launch right now, but this no. is your book launch today now. Yes, here. it is. Um, you can get it at most bookstores. Uh, and of course, all the usual suspects, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, Target will ship it to you. Walmart will ship it to you. Um, I, it's like I say, it's available pretty much every place. And right at the moment, I think Amazon has it on special. So you can save a couple of bucks. I still get paid. So I'm going to see more. <laughs> well, if, you know, I've read all the books, this is the latest Shadow Hill by, I call him Tom because I've known him as Tom, but his pen name is Thomas Kyes. And he and I have talked on a previous episode as to why he went Thomas versus Tom. You can pick this book up without having read the other three. Um, and you'll get it. It's standalone, but I encourage everybody to get the first three books, start from the beginning, read all the way through. They should start doing a bundle, Tom. Well, actually, yeah. 
Am Amazon does have them bundled. Um, and I was telling you beforehand, uh, they came, they actually re-released Random Road and uh, Barnes and Noble picked it up in a big way. And it's been on the, at the front of all 600 stores since, uh, since April. So um, yeah, you know, yeah, buy all the books. I, that's, Isn't that great? That's my advice. <laughs> Yeah, I could I could easily see myself starting at book one again and just reading them in order. And when uh, I've never admitted this on the air, but when Brad Taylor, when I was asked if I would interview him, I thought he was a different Brad. And I was so excited because I'd loved all of the Brad I thought it was books. So when I realized it wasn't the same Brad, but I had said okay and I only had five days until he was going to be on the show. I went to the library and I took, he had three shelves of books and I had never heard of them before. I literally took shelves of books home and I, I spent four days reading from his first book to his last book. Thank God I can speed read. And it's fascinating to read them literally back to back to back. And I forget binging Netflix. I think people need to binge the books. All right. So you can get the books, Shadow Hill, anywhere books are sold, right, Tom? And yep. how do they reach you if they want to talk to you? Uh, I have a lot of people who listen to my show who are podcast hosts who might want to have you on the show. So also, how do they reach out to you? Um, actually, they can reach out through my website, which is uh, thomaskaisauthor.com. There's a button that will uh, send a message directly to my Gmail account. Um and uh, if you if you if you want to, you can always go through uh, Poison Pen Press. Uh, they've got a website with a phone number, and my uh, my publicist will be happy to get back to you. She's been setting up some podcasts uh, for this particular bo book. And Laura, of course, you're the first and the best. So um, thank you for having me on your show. Well, thank you for being here. Is did I? How, did I spell all that right? Okay, perfect. perfect. ThomasKaisAuthor.com. Yeah. For those who are only listening on podcast, that's Thomas Kais and it's K-I-E-S author.com where you can reach out to Tom and the books are available wherever people prefer to buy books. Um, I love it. It's awesome. And Tom, thanks for being my my first live show back. You You made my day by making this so easy for me to do and letting me geek out over one of my favorite authors. You're so sweet. <laughs> All right. Well, do me a favor because your pup's not obviously in your office. Give your pup a hug for me. I will. And she's, she's just absolutely adorable. So, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, and and that's, one other, that's one other thing my wife will never let me do is in any of my books, you can never hurt a dog. Oh, God, no. I hate when they do that in books. Oh, God, no. It, it just slaughters me, kills me. Nope, never happened. Okay. All right. So um, everybody should also follow Tom on social media because he lists a whole bunch of stuff. He talks about creative writing. And um, you might want to maybe consider doing some sort of online creative writing. That would be a lot of fun for uh, people. Actually, I've, I've had some people ask if I would. I, I haven't gone in that direction yet, but uh, who knows? Uh, I think it would be awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today on your launch day. I know this book is going to skyrocket to the top of the charts because it's worth it. It's really, really great, Tom. Love you, Laura. All right. All right, everybody. We are here with Thomas Kyes, author of the Geneva Chase series of books. His latest is Shadow Hill. You obviously heard how much I fan geek on him. I want to thank everybody who's commented, um, welcoming me back, Joe Popper, Kathleen Martin, Joel Wald, Tina Frank, Jim Dean, all of you and the many others. And Tom, thank you for being here with me on the show. Um, I'm ready to just disconnect right now and shut off. This took so much energy, but I'm so glad I got to be here with you all today. Can't believe I've been offline for six weeks since um, I ended up in the emergency room and ended up having surgery. It's a joy to be back here with you all and to, to share my love of asking questions, my love of books, 
of all kinds and, and just to be here with you. So have a great day, everybody. Remember to grab a copy of Tom's latest book, Shadow Hill. I highly recommend you get the first three books as well. And I'd love to hear what you think of the books when you read them. And at the end of the day, the right questions can change your life. So what are you asking today? Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today.